as we continue this sermon series reading through Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, I turn our attention back to chapter 1. Let us hear these words. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all making request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that the one who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, even as it is meet for me to think this of all of you, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defiance and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of my grace. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent, and that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ and to the glory and praise of God. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, I'm going to test your memory a little bit. On September 8, 1966, one of the best-loved science fiction shows of all time premiered. Do you know what it was? <laughs> Somebody's got the uh, Spock thing going on there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I didn't much appreciate that series when I was a kid. But my older sister, Debbie, loved Star Trek. And she would watch the reruns again and again and again. So much so that I had memorized that famous opening you remember as you peer out into space and Captain Kirk had those wonderful words played, of course, by the incomparable William Shatner at that time, right? He had those words that he said, space, the final frontier. And then out of nowhere, the Enterprise emerges and starts gliding through, whisking across our screens, speeds off into space, and he continues... These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise, its five-year mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before. And then you'd hear that unmistakable Star Trek theme tune, right? You can hear it in your head right now, can't you? Yeah. Well, my friends... If you've been engaging in the slow read through the book of Philippians with me, you know by now that Paul continues to talk about grace, the grace of God as the core to our Christian faith. And Paul proclaims that the Lord is gracious to all of us and that that grace allows us to boldly go where no one has gone before, to boldly set out on new adventures in life. That grace of God goes before us, goes with us, and helps us to be the people that God has called us to be. And we need to be reminded of that often because we tend to forget. We forget that we live by God's grace, not just by our own strength. And so, in the baptismal liturgy that we celebrated today, we were reminded of God's grace. God's grace that precedes us, naming us and claiming us as God's beloved, even before we know our own name. God's grace then follows us throughout our life, through all of the ups and downs of life, helping us to be faithful in our walk. We need to remember God's grace because it's so easy to forget God's grace in this crazy world that we live in, to start to feel like we're living all alone, almost like that 
old song from the band Green Day. And some of you probably remember that 2004 hit, Boulevard of Broken Dreams. Listen to those lyrics. I walk a lonely road, the only one I have ever known. Don't know where it goes, but it's home to me, and I walk alone. I walk this empty street on the boulevard of broken dreams, where the city sleeps, and I'm the only one, and I walk alone. My shadow's only one that walks beside me. My shallow heart's the only thing that's beating. Sometimes I wish someone out there will find me till I walk alone. Have you ever felt alone in life? Have you ever felt like life is so difficult and you don't know where to turn? That's where God's grace comes in to help sustain us through those times. I think about this because I think about where Paul was when he wrote this letter to the church in Philippi. Paul was alone. He was alone in a dark prison cell. He was being held on capital charges. The Romans considered Paul a troublemaker in their day, a ringleader of a group that claimed allegiance to a lord other than the emperor. Paul was charged with treason. And he sits in this cell all alone and writes this letter to the people in Philippi where he had started a church. And did you realize how much grace and gratitude is in that first chapter? I don't think I would be filled with grace and gratitude as I sat in a dark prison accused of treason misunderstood, treated badly, away from all of my friends, from all of those that I loved and cared about, not able to do what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it, I believe that I would have found it very difficult to be filled with grace and gratitude at that time especially grace towards those who had imprisoned me and yet the scriptures tell us that all of the imperial guard knew about Paul's graciousness as he shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with him. You see, the grace that he received from God changed his life so much that now the purpose of Paul's life and the purpose that he imparted to the church as the purpose that he felt God had given to the church was to offer grace and to seek reconciliation with everyone in every relationship for us to live in unity with one another, living a life of graciousness. Now, my friends, that requires some courage because it, it makes a choice, a choice to be gracious when people haven't been gracious back to you. I believe that I need to confess to you that if I had been in Paul's place, I would have struggled deeply with having grace. Because when I look at the deep divisions that are within the church and within the Christian faith right now, it baffles me. It baffles me how vastly differently we can interpret Scripture, especially when Jesus says to love one another, how we can have so many different ideas about what that means and how that should look. And so I recognize how difficult it is to be gracious with people who think differently and act differently. Seems to me that for Paul it would have been easier for him to whine and complain as he sat there. To whine and complain about how people didn't understand the gospel that he was preaching and proclaiming. How people didn't understand that Jesus came to set us free from all that constrains us. Not just whine and complain and grumble, but maybe want to seek some retaliation and revenge against those people who had imprisoned him. I don't know, maybe some of you are like me. And when you find people who are disagreeable around you or who have harmed you, you find it easier to just try to ignore them and get away from them and do what you can to not have to associate with them. But other people, 
when someone has hurt them or someone is disagreeable with them, they tend to take the same stance that Opie Taylor took in one of those episodes of The Andy Griffith Show. Some of you might remember the Andy Griffith episode titled Horse Traders. In that particular episode, Opie comes in to his father's sheriff's office one day, and he asks if he can leave his books there because he's going to go over to his friend's house. He said he'll come back on his skateboard. And Andy says, well, how are you going to come back on your skateboard when you don't have a skateboard with you right now to go over to his house? And Opie says, well, I'm going to get a skateboard when I get there. You see, Jerry and me are making a trade with one another. His skates for my licorice seeds. Andy and Barney look kind of puzzled. They look at Opie. And Opie explains to them that he traded his cat pistol, pistol for some licorice seeds. And now he's going to trade those licorice seeds for a skateboard because the seeds are fake and they don't produce any licorice. And Andy's a little bit concerned, and he tells Opie, now, now, son, you've been taught the golden rule, haven't you? The golden rule. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And he asks Opie if he's been thinking about following that rule. And Opie says, oh, yes, yes. I have been thinking about that rule. You see, I got those licorice seeds from Tommy, and I'm going to do unto Jerry what Tommy did unto me. <laughs> and wise old Andy says, I believe you're bending that rule just a bit. Bending that rule. We have a tendency to bend that rule, to do unto others as they've done unto us, rather than as we would have them do. Paul, however, chose to be courageous and show grace believing that he was loved by God and that everyone is beloved by God and that no one deserves to be done unto. Even those who treated him like he was the enemy, even his captors. He looked to Jesus Christ, the graciousness that Jesus had taught us in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus said, go the second mile, turn the other cheek, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Be merciful like your heavenly Father is merciful. But Jesus didn't just teach it. Remember, he lived it. They weren't just words. Jesus lived that way. Recall how Jesus spoke tenderly to the woman taken in adultery when he said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And remember how when he died on the cross, he cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The Gospels make it clear that Jesus showed us how to live a life of create, courageous graciousness. Extending grace and love and acceptance and forgiveness to others, whether they ask for it, whether they deserve it, whether they give it back to us, it doesn't matter. We freely give it. We live a life of grace to everyone. Living this way is the primary aim of the way to live the Christian life. It's the key test of Christian character when we can live graciously for others. In essence, Jesus put it like this. If you will live with a big heart and a big spirit, if you will live with love unconditionally like I do, then people will know that you are my disciples. It's that kind of life that Edwin Markham wrote about in his famous poem. Edwin Markham had been hurt and betrayed by a dear friend of his, a trusted friend of his, but he dealt with that knowing that God's grace was there at work in his own life. He dealt with that pain, and then he was able to write these classic words. He drew a circle that shut me out, Heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I, the wit to win, we drew a circle that took him in. That's what the courage to be gracious looks like, reaching out to everyone. 
I remember in my history classes reading about Dr. Booker T. Washington and how he lived a gracious life. Dr. Booker T. Washington, the great African-American educator, one day was walking to work at the famous Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. And he passed by a mansion of a very wealthy woman. The woman didn't recognize Dr. Washington. She called out to him thinking that he was just one of the farmhands, one of the workers in her big plantation. She said, hey you, come here. I need some wood chopped. And without a word, Dr. Washington peeled off his jacket and he picked up an ax and he went to work and he not only cut the wood for her but he also carried that firewood into her house and he arranged it very neatly in her fireplace setting it so that she could have a warm fire that night he had scarcely left her house when one of her servants said to the woman well I guess you didn't recognize who he was ma'am but that was Professor Dr. Washington, embarrassed and red-faced, the woman hurried over to the Tuskegee Institute to apologize to Dr. Washington, and Booker T. Washington replied this way, and I quote, there's no need to apologize, madam. I'm delighted to do favors for my friends. That story underscores the graciousness of Booker T. Washington, the way he was day in and day out with everyone. He refused to be disturbed by the rudeness or the persecution or the indifference of other people around him. And this is the quote I want to share with you. He said, I will permit no person to narrow or degrade my soul by making me hate him or her. That's the courage to be gracious, the courage to take the high road. So what does it take? What does it take for us to have the courage to be gracious? Well, I believe, first of all, it takes being big enough to look for the best in other people, to be slow to condemn others and quick to praise them. The gracious person speaks kind words and avoids gossip and avoids destructive criticism. In the book, This is Living, Leonard Griffith writes this, criticism is the favorite indoor sport of small minds, insidious to a Christian. When its ugly stench fills the air around us, and people begin babbling pontifically about the faults of other people, the Christian should feel inclined to open a window and shut their own mouth. By this, our witness of silence, we refuse to participate. But that's not enough, the Apostle Paul says, for silence can too easily be taken for assent. If you believe in judging people generously, if you believe in withholding any judgment until you have all the facts, if you think that people in glass houses ought not to throw stones, if you have too much respect for human personality to damage it with your tongue or with your pen or with a swipe of your finger on the internet, if you believe that the Christian thing to do is to always give others the benefit of the doubt, then speak up and say so, so that it's clear to everyone. As Christians, we ought to be called to speak good and not evil, to speak words of kindness in this world of cruelty, and to portray love, always, not hate. Recently, a friend of mine told me that he was in a college town for a speaking engagement and he went out to dinner and he overheard some college students in the booth next to him talking. He said he really didn't want to eavesdrop, but they were talking so loud he heard their entire conversation. And it made him think. He said they were gossiping about one of their other classmates, a sophomore girl named Kathy. 
they were actually lambasting her, he said, criticizing her sharply, crucifying her in a way with hard and cruel words. And all of them were having this field day talking about her, laughing at their cuts, ripping her apart with condemning words, all of them except one young man named George. George just sat there in silence, not participating in the conversation at all as they roasted their classmate. And finally, the others realized that George was being quiet, not participating in the conversation. And so they tried to pull him into that verbal onslaught to say something negative about Kathy. George, what do you think? Isn't it awful how Kathy's been acting? They ought to kick her out of school, don't you think? Oh, we wish they would. She's a disgrace. Don't you agree, George? Don't you agree? And here's what George did. George sat there quietly for just a moment, and then he spoke up. And this is what he said. You know, I have way too many faults of my own to be critical of Kathy, or for that matter, to be critical of anybody. Besides that, I like Kathy. She's my friend. In fact, she is our friend. She has so many wonderful qualities, and I think you ought to focus on the good things about Kathy. You know, she's really a lot of fun, and I hope that someday you can all get to know her like I do and appreciate her. Besides that, my mom taught me an important lesson some years ago that I've tried the best of my ability to live every day. She said, George, remember this. Brilliant people talk about ideas. Ordinary people talk about things. Little people talk about other people. The Apostle Paul encourages us to be gracious, to have the courage to not grumble and complain and gripe and gossip, but to be gracious in our speech. One of my posts this week on Facebook was a challenge that I felt Paul was giving to us from the book of Philippians, a challenge to go 24 hours without grumbling or complaining, whining, griping, or arguing. Can you do it? 24 hours without being judgmental of anyone. Politicians, co-workers, neighbors, family members. If you can't, then ask for God's grace to help you. Because you know, if a person can't go a day without alcohol, that person's called an alcoholic and they need help because they're addicted to alcohol. If a person can't go a day without abusing drugs, we say that person's a drug addict and they need help because they have an addiction. If a person can't go a day without gambling, we say that they have an addiction to gambling and they need to get help. Well, the same is true about negativity, whining and complaining. If we can't go a day without being judgmental and harshly critical of others, then we have a problem. But here's the good news. God's grace will give us a new beginning just as it gave Paul a new beginning. Paul, the one who had been so critical of the Christians, persecuting the Christians, received God's grace into his life and it totally transformed him so that he went about giving grace to others. The courage to be gracious means being big enough to look for the best in other people and to share that grace with them. May it be so for you and for me in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.